uh, we're back, uh, and we're going into block two. Uh, so this is uh, just loosely titled New Directions in Consensus. Uh, and since block three builds on top of block two, block three is also related to New Directions in Consensus. So uh, the remainder of the day is going to be talking about um, a bunch of different ways of doing consensus. So the morning was more like blockchain related. We haven't really you know, discussed the older style Byzantine agreements. Um, but uh, yeah, we want, we want to have a number of, of different discussions on uh, basically new ideas or new ways of thinking uh, about consensus that um, uh, just the world hasn't caught up, caught up with yet. Uh, in fact, you, most great ideas, or a lot of great ideas are actually not that new. Uh, so you'll see throughout the rest of the talks uh, things that are um, maybe have been proposed um, many years ago, sometimes even decades ago, um, but there are actually really good ideas to consider uh, when building large-scale um, consensus systems that are supposed to scale to the you know, needs of the, of the internet today. Uh, and that you know, has a whole bunch of, um, we want to solve for a whole bunch of different kinds of properties. Um, so the uh, structure of this section uh, is that you know, I'm giving kind of this, this intro right now. Um, David will talk about uh, Stellar. Uh, as we said earlier, Mark couldn't make it. He was, uh, he's sick. Uh, but he sends his, his regards. Uh, and then we'll have, um, whoa, whoops. We'll have a, a set of lightning talks um, uh, there. So we have three, uh, three already, uh, and we might, we might get more uh, at that point. And then we'll have kind of a workshop. Uh, great. So let's, uh, uh, one thing that I wanted to kind of uh, start with is if we reflect back on sort of the history of consensus, and you know, the, I might have missed some of the ordering here. There's been a whole bunch of like, really critical um, results along the way uh, that have refined our understanding of the problem and refined our understanding of uh, different ways of, of making it useful um, for all kinds of, of systems with different kinds of properties and so on. Um, it's pretty notable that uh, the, the, uh, w one of the things I like most about uh, blockchain's contribution to consensus is that it really changed the problem from, hey, let's agree among a small cluster of nodes that are usually managed by parties, but where the fault tolerance is about, um, hey, maybe an attacker has compromised a machine, to dealing with uh, internet level uh, networks where you have potentially millions of participants in this consensus, um, dealing with transactions that are highly contentious, where there is significant disagreement worldwide about the outcomes, uh, and yet still manage to, to do transaction processing and agree on the computing side of it, or like on the computing sequence of events, um, in a way that allows us to build applications. Uh, you know, they kind of build in this, the, these governance mechanisms. So I think there's a bunch of interesting directions um, in the future. And so if we kind of compress the, the, the past, uh, what lies ahead? What, what are the kinds of, uh, of, of directions uh, that maybe we're already going in, but you know, are still kind of taking off and, and are going to become um, a bigger deal in, in, in the world? Uh, but what new ideas might appear uh, over the next few years? And so I think this is a, a uh, um, the re the, I think the revival of consensus as a, as a key uh, greenfield area for, for research is, is really exciting. And I think it's only the beginning. So I think uh, this is getting. Um, warming up in a bunch of ways, and we'll continue to find new ways of achieving consensus. Um, one, one of the pieces about uh, that, where, where I think this will relate to, to a bunch of uh, systems and applications that people are, are trying to build is that how consensus protocols will mix in with other ways of getting a convergent state uh, that mix in, in how like, real world applications work today um, is not really figured out yet. So we use consensus in these kind of financial systems that, that require um, Agreement, and we use consensus in like backend systems to do like transaction processing in a database setting. Um, but in the client side, in mobile applications, we're starting to use things like CRDTs that do eventually consistent things because we don't care about the you know the, the security there is very different. So how will these two systems kind of con uh, end up converging? Uh, and if you squint at some of the solutions in consensus and the solutions in CRDTs, they act, they, they relate in a lot of ways. So there are things like sharding state in consensus that is being used to um, think of hierarchies uh, and splitting off you know, some part of the state in one protocol and some part of the state in another so you can get higher scalability. Uh, the same kind of thing is happening in the CRDT space where you have uh, CRDTs basically um, uh, claiming control over some subset of the state to be able to um, uh, have authority over that outcome through a, a long-running partition. 
Uh, so there's going to be probably a lot of mixing of ideas across these fields and, and others um, that will yield a bunch of uh, good ideas. So again, new protocols are here needed, uh, and we'll see uh, 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 a lot of good ideas. Uh, I wanted to uh, give you a flavor of one, mostly because it was uh, came up in conversation. Um, oh, and by the way, I'll uh, again point this out: like consensus bottleneck is a problem. <laughs> Let's uh, scale this. Um, uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about a thing um, that, that we've been calling kind of power fault tolerance. Uh, and, and the idea is that uh, there might actually be a need for thinking about models uh, it, a bit in, in a different way than, than traditional uh, BFT, where um, you can think of the, uh, you, you can think of, of participants' ability to influence the outcome of a consensus protocol. So at the end of the day, parties are coming together to run a, an algorithm uh, to agree on a, on a value and agree on, on, on the outcome of an event. Um, that process traditionally has been seen as just identities voting on, on the outcome. And for a very long time, that was um, uh, the idea. And uh, what Bit one of Bitcoin's contributions was to say, hey, what if we don't take people's words for it, but instead uh, force parties to vote with something that can't easily be faked, which is just some physical resource of, of a sort. And that, of course, has triggered a whole bunch of Look, uh, looking into other ways of, of voting with um, uh, proofs of space, uh, proofs of bandwidth, um, all kinds of uh, different protocols have emerged. Um, but one, one way that we've been uh, thinking about it, about it is, what if we consider, um, one sec, let me find a, yeah, what if, what if we consider that um, at the end of the day, Parties have some way of affecting and influencing the outcome of the consensus protocol. You know, whatever protocol you end up defining for, for what that power is, uh, is kind of subject to, to the you know, concrete protocol that you're using. Uh, but you should be able to reason about uh, how that party can use that power to influence the outcome. So if you're voting um, with a digital signature, hey, the malicious party could actually forge that signature and, and uh, present two, um, two different signed messages. Uh, voting for two different outcomes, and this is what leads to all kinds of multi-round protocols in the traditional uh, business and agreement literature. Um, but you know, in the proof of work world, we don't quite have that problem, or we have it in a different way, where um, we you can't directly forge a message twice because you have to expend physical work doing so. Um, and if you have if you run a huge Bitcoin mine and you're committing all of the energy of your of your Bitcoin miners uh, to one candidate value, you can't also commit that into a different candidate value. Uh, so that presents a, a way of bounding or restricting what, what um, the adversary could do. Uh, and so then it hints at, hey, if we reason through, through this, could we uh, come up with a way to weave consensus um, by requiring parties uh, to, to really commit their vote in some way? So. Um, Proof of stake protocols that are so, sort of set in between the proof of world, uh, proof of work world, and the traditional voting structure, and that's why you get all these constructions with a lot of validators, where you elect a committee and they have to um, sign a bunch of things and propagate them around, and then you have to notice two parties signing the same thing and slash them and, and all that kind of stuff, and so you get that same communication complexity thing because you're trying to detect lying. Uh, but perhaps you could be able to prevent, you, you could use the proof of work analogy and prevent lying altogether. Um, so, so one of the, the things that, uh, that we found, uh, we kind of got to this set of ideas by thinking about uh, kind of storage power and, and so on, being able to commit the you know, physical storage resources into something. Um, and one of the directions where, where all the VDF work that we were talking about earlier today uh, is that it is, hey, you have some sequential process that we can all agree on uh, on the ticking of, now subject to assumptions about hardware, right? Some hardware speed ups could, could drastically speed up one, one party's uh, uh, computer and not, not the other. Uh, e even with those kinds of assumptions, if you could bound the, the, uh, the if, if you could reason about what, what you expect that party's uh, limitations on, the, on their total power could be, uh, then you could actually build a consensus protocol out of that, um, where you know that some party cannot vote uh, you know, a thousand times, maybe they can vote somewhere between 10 or 100 times. And you start getting uh, much more clarity around um, the participation in, in the protocol. And of course, you would want it to be exact. Uh, and so this is uh, there's a whole bunch of um, different. Uh, so, so if you if you kind of think about generalizing this 
power scheme, uh, you think of being able to classify a protocol in terms of three, three things. One is, could you count the total power in the network? Do you have a reliable way of doing that? So in traditional business scene agreements, we do that by just counting the number of parties. Uh, in proof of stake protocols, we do that by counting the amount of, of money in the network. And um, there's complicated rules here that make sure that you don't count the money in, in the current block or like the last block. You have a look back parameter to count it uh, before a certain height. Um, in Bitcoin, we have an estimator that has a synchrony assumption where you, are, you re reason about the total amount of power in the network. And you sort of hope that people can't show up with vastly more energy uh, overnight and overtake the network. And so that's kind of a, an assumption about the economic realities of Earth today, where somebody's not going to show up with uh, 10 times the amount of, uh, of energy uh, of the Bitcoin network and kind of overtake it. And so there's kind of an implicit assumption uh, there in kind of like the count power part of it, but it's not very exact. It's an estimator that runs over two weeks, has all kinds of problems with it, um, relies on synchrony, relies on timestamps, uh, and so potentially could be exploited. Uh, so this suggests that if you kind of study these three properties, how, how um, power is counted, how uh, miners receive different power amounts, meaning, hey, um, in Bitcoin, it's open membership, so somebody can show up with another hashing machine and just add it and gain power. So that's a really nice property. Uh, in some Byzantine agreements, you, actually, you have to be blessed in, or, or it has to be set at the beginning of the protocol and cannot be changed. So that's you know, a different set of use cases. Um, uh, but, you know, for example, thinking of different ways of, of creating, you know, setting this power might yield different consensus protocol ideas. So this is kind of a, a fertile ground for coming up with new consensus ideas if you can think of different and clever ways of, of changing these properties. And probably the most important thing here is how do you commit the power to a candidate value? So if you have a, um, you, in the Bitcoin case, it's pretty easy. You take the current candidate value and then you uh, try to hash it and so on. That's a, that's a really difficult way to reuse power on. Um, in uh, digital signatures we discussed, uh, that can't, uh, you can lie, and so you have to spot liars. And so you have a you know, high communication complexity set of protocols to spot the liars. Um, and the, uh, but, but there might be a whole bunch of other ways to, to commit the power. For, uh, for example, if we had a, um, you know, I don't like this analogy because I don't like SGX, but uh, SGX is, a, is an example of a thing uh, that you could, you know, if you, if you sort of trust the assumptions of, of something like SGX, uh, where you um, could give it a, a certain um, key and it's, it's signing messages out of it and it guarantees that it won't sign a single message twice, then maybe you can revisit the, the assumptions around the digital signatures and now you have something where a party can't lie. And so you can, you can potentially commit the, um, uh, commit the power. Uh, of, of a certain party at a particular round. And you know, a key thing here is that it's not just commit the power of a certain party, it's commit the power of a, of a party at a particular round of time. So this is where VDF assumptions and, and like the time delay assumptions come in, uh, which is another aspect of synchrony. Uh, David and I were talking about this uh, earlier. Uh, the, there seem to be, or, or I claim there seem to be two different aspects of synchrony in consensus protocols. One is related to the, to the uh, uh, messaging and the connectivity of, of a network. And another aspect of synchrony is around um, the, the power that you have and that you're exerting over the system. So in traditional Byzantine agreements, you don't have to think about this very much because everyone has the same power all the time. But in, in, um, in something like Bitcoin, you have uh, this weird process going on where you're kind of sampling uh, power and you might get lucky, but on expectation, you, you're likely to do it within a certain amount of time. Um, in VDFs, you then have a, a timing assumption where you're, you're dealing with the hardware and how fast the hardware could go. Um, there might be some physical limits to be exploited there um, and, and, and so on. But there seem to be, if you kind of hide all of the timing assumptions in the second part of synchrony, then maybe you can get away with, um, with a, uh, relaxing some constraints on, on the other. Uh, great, so that's, that's a, uh, a, the type of, of, of I think, ideas and models that if we kind of explore and then we just consider, hey, what, what are different ways of committing power um, and how, how th this might yield a whole bunch of different kinds of protocols. Uh, and this is one of the ways that we got into Podcoin or, or that we made the Podcoin storage power thing work. Uh, it might be a fertile ground for other people and thinking of different, different kinds of protocols. Uh, but yeah, that's a random example.